please keep that in mind. Father, it's good to come together this morning. I thank you for all who have come. and We want to pray your blessing now upon this time of worship. We need your touch. We need your presence. We need your power in this place. And I pray, Father, that you would meet us at our point of need. Just draw us close to you. And touch us, Father, where we need to be touched today that will make a difference in our lives. Make a difference in the way we see things. And make a difference in the way that we feel and relate to others. I pray, Father, that there will be joy in this place. <coughs> For joy to the world, the Lord has come. And I pray, Father, that the joy will permeate this building and explode and expand to those outside. I pray the joy of Christmas will flow out these doors in these days. In Jesus' name I pray.
you stand with us? We do come this morning to adore him, to lift up that great Savior. Amen. Hark the herald angels sing. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Hail the heavenly prince of peace, hail the Son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, rest with healing in his wings. Mild he lays, mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory. by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, laid in life, behold, he come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Loud he lays, loud he lays his glory. Hey. 
praise you this morning with our voices and father I pray even more importantly we praise you with our heart father for you see past the audible of the voice and right into the heart from which it comes so father we praise you the one on high the great I am how great our joy this morning to know you father we pray in this season you would help us to be diligent to share the truth of the gospel that others might know this great joy of who you are. Father, I pray that you'll bless our time this morning, our worship, our listening, our hearing, and our doing of the word. Father, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Chapter 1, I'll be reading as we begin, verses 26 and 27. I've come with message number 2 in our series, Christmas as Angels Saw It. Christmas as Angels Saw It. This morning we're going to focus on Mary and the angels as they related to Mary. I understand that the outline will not be on the screen this morning, so you'll need to follow along there in your bulletin. There are three points to the message this morning. All of them will start with the letter A. A little girl was playing music one evening when her father came into her room. He watched her dance around and sing to the music. She was singing that little nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. It made the children laugh and play to see the lamb at school. And when she had finished the song, the little girl looked up at her father with tears and she said, you know, Daddy, Mary really did have a little lamb. He was the lamb of God. John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This morning, I want to look at Christmas as the angels saw it. I want to talk about that first Christmas as the angels saw Mary have a lamb. Look at the scripture with me. Verses 26, 27 of Luke 1. Now in the sixth month, that refers to the time when Gabriel came to Mary's cousin Elizabeth six months later. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. 
Dr. Luke, in these two verses, tells us some things that we need to make note of concerning Mary. Dr. Luke tells us that she resided in Nazareth. Nazareth was about 70 miles north of Jerusalem in Galilee. Perhaps you know the story of Philip who began to notice and recognize Jesus as Messiah. He went and he got his friend Nathaniel, and he brought him to Jesus and introduced him to Jesus as Messiah. And when Philip told Nathaniel he was Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Not because it was a small village, but because it was corrupt and immoral. It was a Roman outpost. It was known for drunkenness, prostitution, and sexual immorality. The soldiers would come into town and they would find a prostitute. In a day or two, they would be on their way and rumors would swirl. That is why rumors swirled when unmarried Mary was pregnant. Also, Dr. Luke tells us that this Mary was a virgin. Not only that she was from Nazareth, but that she was a virgin. And he uses the Greek word pothanos which generally refers to a female who is not married and still is a virgin. To put it another way, a woman who has not yet been intimate with a man. But I notice that Paul uses that same word in 1 Corinthians to refer to a young woman. So the word here literally speaks of a young woman, a pure woman of marital or marriageable age. Now let me quickly say as I share the message this morning, if you do not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, you have some problems. You have a problem with Mary. For you see, if Mary had a child out of wedlock, then Mary is an impure woman. Would that Mary be chosen by God to bear the Son of God? You've got a problem with Mary, but you've also got a problem with Jesus. If Jesus had not been born of a virgin, he would have been born of Adam. And in Adam all die. A sinful Jesus Christ could not be the perfect sacrifice to appease the wrath of God towards sin. You've got a problem with Mary. You've got a problem with Jesus. But you've also got a problem with his word. It's flawed because the Bible tells us that she was a virgin. If you do not believe in the virgin birth, you've got some real problems. Let me quickly say to you, the virgin birth is not incidental to our Christian faith. It is foundational to our Christian faith. Now, you don't have to understand the virgin birth to validate, to validate it. Adrian Rogers once said, don't worry if you can't explain the virgin birth. You couldn't explain the virgin birth any more than you can explain God. Our only explanation for the virgin birth is the fact that nothing is impossible with God. Dr. Luke tells us that Mary was from Nazareth. He tells us she was a virgin, but he also tells us she was betrothed to Joseph. The Greek word here that that he uses is in the act or is uh, recognized in an active voice and in a passive voice. Manastio is the way you pronounce that Greek word. And in the active voice, it means to woo or to win for marriage. But here's something you need to know. 
That word in the active voice is not used in the New Testament. It's only used in the passive voice. And so it means a promise to be married. A betrothal was a promise to be married. You see, the Jewish marriage process in these ancient days began with an arrangement of marriage. The parents made the arrangement of marriage. Now, young people today have many resources to look for a mate. But it was not so in the day of Mary and Joseph. Their parents chose them for one another. Then once the children became marriageable age, they entered into a betrothal period, much like our engagement stage, but there was no intimacy. The couple did not live together, but vows were made and promises were exchanged. That's why Joseph thought about divorcing Mary privately. And then the final stage was the ceremony and the celebration. Dr. Robert Jeffries says Mary was probably 13 to 15 years old and Joseph was probably 17 to 18, what they would consider in that day, in that custom, as marriageable age. Young Mary, right there in the midst of her living life in Nazareth, we might say she was minding her own business and Gabriel appeared to her and the angelic host witnessed one of their own coming to the Virgin Mary. Let me tell you what they saw. There's three things they saw. They saw it anticipated. That's the first word, anticipated. You see, Paul wrote in Galatians 4, 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. Folks, the angels and the lost world awaited the fullness of time to come. The birth of the Messiah, the Lamb of God, was greatly anticipated. Now, this concept, of Messiah being the Lamb of God is strategically uh, tied to the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, we learn where the blood of the Lamb saved God's people from that final plague, the death angel, as God worked to release his people from Egyptian bondage. But God gave them specific instructions on what to do with the lamb and what to do with the blood that the blood might save them from the death angel. They could take the animal from the sheep or the goats but it was to be examined by the priest and it had to be without spot. It had to be without blemish. It could be, there could be no imperfections on the animal. It was to be chosen on the 10th day, but not killed until the 4th day. You know why? Because during that time period, the family was to take that little lamb into their home. And the children would play with it, and they would love on it. And it would become a member of the family. But on the 14th day, four days later, the father would take that little lamb and he would kill it and the blood would be caught in a basin. And the hurt of the animal killed was felt throughout the family, teaching the seriousness of sacrifice. And then the blood was applied to the doorpost and the lintel of the house. And as the death angel passed by, the people inside were saved. They were saved by the blood. The Passover, as it came to be called, is an Old Testament typology of the Messiah as the Lamb of God. You see, Moses' lamb was a type of Mary's lamb. Mary's lamb, Jesus, was without spot or blemish. He was greatly loved by many. 
His blood saves sinners. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7 or 5 verse 7, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. 700 years before Christ, Isaiah wrote about this lamb. In chapter 53, he writes, The Messiah would come and be be as a lamb being led to the slaughter. As the writer of Hebrews put it, Jesus was the perfect once and for all sacrifice for our sin. You see, throughout history, the angels anticipated the coming of the Lamb of God and they waited for the fullness of time. Mary and Joseph had been anticipating the birth of Jesus for nine months. The angel told Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sin. But folks, they did not know all that that meant until Jesus came and he explained what it was concerning his death while he ministered here on the earth. Then they learned that their little lamb The lamb of the world was going to be a sacrificial lamb. When you came in today, you received a little candy cane. As I was shaking hands earlier, some had said, Brother Matt, I've already eaten my candy cane. (laughs) But I gave this to you this morning for a reason. I want to use it as an illustration. Did you know there was a candy maker in Indiana who wanted to make a candy to be a witness? The hardness of this candy symbolizes the solid rock, the foundation of the church, the firmness of God's promises. The candy maker made it in the form of a J to represent the precious name of Jesus who came to this earth to be our Savior. And then thinking it was somewhat plain, the candy maker stained it with the red stripes to symbolize the blood of Jesus which was shed that we might have eternal life. Folks, the world was waiting for the Savior to come. The world needed a Savior. The angels watched with great anticipation. They saw the message. They saw the Lamb anticipated. But secondly, They saw it announced. Not long ago, we were watching America's home videos or funniest videos, and there was a family that had gathered for Thanksgiving. The mother pulled the turkey out of the oven, set it up on top of the stove, turned around to do some other things, and when she turned back around, there was a blue egg sitting there. It was on the end where she had put in all that stuffing. I mean, it looked like it had just rolled out of the turkey. She was shocked. And she began to ask all of her family members, where where did this egg come from? And they all told her that they didn't know. And finally, she found out that it was a gender reveal. (laughs) Yeah, it was a boy announcement. And the mother, the soon-to-be grandmother, went ballistic with joy. I love good announcements, don't you? I shared with you last week that Gabriel always has good news. Whenever Gabriel comes on the scene, somebody's going to be blessed. And Gabriel came with good news. Now here's a question that I ask myself. Why? Did God choose Mary of Nazareth? There are three reasons. Number one, whoever was the mother of the Messiah had to be a Jewish, a Jewess. Every Jewish mother in those days prayed that her child would be the promised Messiah. The mother of Jesus had to be Jewish. Secondly, the girl had to be from the tribe of Judah or from the lineage and household of David. 
As Paul writes, the child had to be the seed of David, Romans 1.3. The promised Messiah and Savior of the world was through the line and lineage of David. And in Luke's genealogy, he assures us that Mary has come through the lineage and line of David. And the third thing, she had to be a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14 prophesies, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. God is with us. Now you may be thinking, well, preacher, I am sure there are other young girls or girls or young adults in, there <coughs> in Nazareth that met those requirements. So why did God focus on Mary the answer is there in verse 28. Look at what it says. And having come in, the angel said, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. The NIV puts it this way. Greetings, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Let me tell you, Mary was chosen out of all others by grace. Grace. Charis in the Greek language. The word means endowed with grace or it means to be enriched with grace. The Roman Catholic prayer that begins, Hail Mary full of grace, is accurate. Mary was full of grace. But so is every sinner that comes to the Savior. I'm full of grace. You're full of grace. You see, Mary's grace was received grace. It wasn't grace to give away. It wasn't grace to bestow on others. Catholics also teach what they call immaculate conception. But it doesn't refer to Jesus, it refers to Mary. They teach because she gave birth to the sinless Messiah, she too is sinless. But you see, Mary didn't even believe that. Because she followed Jesus as her Savior. And you don't need a Savior unless you know you're a sinner. And because of that perceived sinless position, they consider Mary co-mediator with God and man. And so they pray to Mary. But the Bible teaches there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the God-man, the Lord Jesus. And they also believe that Mary was a perpetual virgin. In their prayers, they refer to Mary as the Virgin Mary. Because she gave birth to Jesus as a virgin, virgin, then she remains a virgin. However, the Bible teaches she had other children. She conceived them all the usual way. Joseph, her husband, was the father of her other children. Friend, listen, Mary is best understood by considering the presentation of Dr. Luke, the gospel writer. He does not deify her, nor does he ignore her. He presents her as one to be admired, one to be respected, one whose faith is to be emulated. But folks, she is not to be deified. Mary was blessed to give birth to the Lord Jesus. She was blessed among women. She was chosen by grace. Now, as the angelic host witnesses seen, they began to see some things unfold here. They heard the good news from the angel Gabriel, but oh, they soon witnessed the fear, the fear in Mary. Look at verse 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. See that word troubled there? There's an interesting Greek word behind that word. It comes from dia, which means through, and the word terasso, which means to agitate or to confuse or to be troubled. And so the word basically means 
to be stirred up throughout your being. That's what was going on with Mary. She was greatly disturbed. She was greatly confused. She was greatly confounded. And so Gabriel sensed her fear. And he says to her, verse 30, Do not be afraid. Remember I told you that's one of the angels' often spoken words. Do not be afraid. Hey, that comes from the Greek word phobio or phobio. And from that word phobio, we get our English word phobia. But here it's in the passive voice. And so it means stop fearing or don't start to fear. Don't start to be afraid. And perhaps the angelic host, as they're listening to this word and they see Mary confused and they see her afraid and they hear the angel's word, stop being afraid. Don't start being afraid. Perhaps the angelic host says, is saying, good word, good word, Gabriel. That's what she needed. She needed some encouragement. That's a good word. Then Gabriel delivers the message he came to give. Verse 31. Look at it. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Five descriptive statements to describe her son. The first statement, he will be great. Now I know every mother thinks their child is great, don't you? But I want to tell you, her son was going to be beyond that great. He will be great. He will be the son of the Most High. Did you know the Most High is God? In our culture, the son of a great person is seen as a little lesser than the person himself. But in the Jewish culture, the son of a great man is equal to the great man himself. The most high, the son. The most high, the father. The most high, he will be great. He will be the son of the most high. Here's the third statement. He will have the throne of David. 2 Samuel 7, 16 says, As God said to David, David, one of your descendants will be the Messiah. And he'll sit on your throne. Statement number four, he'll rule over the house of Jacob forever. You know, kings came and went in those days. But this king, this king would rule forever. Finally, of his kingdom, there would be no end. That's what Gabriel came to say. Those are the five statements of his message to Mary. I am thinking now heaven is, is rejoicing. I'm thinking now the heavenly host are singing the hallelujah chorus. King of kings, Lord of lords, I think they're rejoicing. But Mary asked a question. Mary asked a question. I am confident the whole of heaven gets quiet. It's not a question of a lack of faith. It's just a, it's a question. It's a logical question. And you find it there in verse 34. I've not been with a man. Look at verse 35. Gabriel's response. And the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will be the Son of God. Folks, that's the answer to what theologians call the Incarnation. You want to know how God put on flesh? There it is. The incarnation. 
Now, there's no reason for us to speculate today how God did that. If you need an answer, just go to verse 37, where it says all things are possible with God. Really, it says for, for, for with God, nothing is impossible. I took a word to, or took a minute to look up that word nothing. It comes from the Greek word ouk, O-U-K, as trans, uh, transliterified or, 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 or we find it in, in uh, transliterated ouk, O-U-K, and it means absolutely nothing. It means no exceptions. You see, for with God, nothing is impossible. No exceptions. Absolutely nothing. I like how the NIV puts it. Have you got that translation? For no word from God will ever fail. Mary finally has enough explanation. And she starts singing that famous Beatles song. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Mary said... Verse 38, Behold the maid servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I want you to focus on the word maid servant right there. It comes from the Greek word doule, and that can also be translated not only servant but slave. It speaks of submission to one's master. As God's doule, Mary sought no life of her own, no will of her own, no purpose of her own, no plan of her own. All of Mary was subject to the master's will. Her every thought, her every breath, her every action was subject to what God wanted her to do. She was a maidservant. Some translations use the word bond slave. But she was totally surrendered, totally devoted to the Lord. Now all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven must decide a sigh of relief. Perhaps those angels I've been talking about are saying to one another, she has accepted. She is going to be the mother of Jesus. She is willing. She has accepted. All of heaven must have rejoiced. We see here, Everything anticipated. We see it all announced. But can I tell you thirdly and finally, we see it all accomplished. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. You know this very familiar part of the Christmas story. Now there were in the same country shepherds out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night and Behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. I'm sorry, read verses 6 and 7. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. That's the scripture I wanted to share. Look at the word she there. Yeah, that's the focus of these verses that needs a, a, a word. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Focus on that word she right there. Dr. Luke's narrative points to the fact that everything depended upon Mary. That everything that was done, Mary did it. And she brought forth her firstborn son. You see, she was away from her family. She was away from supporting friends in Nazareth. She went through the birth pains. She gave birth. She wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes. And she laid him in a manger. Now, folks, I know Joseph was present. But I want to tell you, fathers are not a whole lot of help in the delivery room. I mean, a father can say breathe all he wants, but he's probably going to get called a name that his wife's never called him before. I read about one delivery, yeah, where the, the man, as his wife was delivering, she, he passed out. And you know what she said? Get up, you're embarrassing me.
I know Joseph was there, but what could he do? Dr. Henry Morris wrote, the fact that she did it all herself points to the loneliness of the delivery. The place of her birth, or the birth, was also adding to the loneliness. You know, so there's been a great debate over the years if Jesus was born in a stable, a cave, or a house. But in these ancient days, houses were usually two stories. And the family would live in the upper floor, but underneath on the first floor, there may be guest quarters. But also there was an area where the animals were brought in case of inclement weather. And usually these houses were built where the first floor was hewn or cut out of a cave. And perhaps this is the situation there for Mary. There is living quarters there, but there's also an area where the animals were kept. And perhaps this is what explains the fact that Mary took Jesus and put him in a manger or an animal eating trough. But I want you to know that the angels saw it all. They saw Mary and Joseph in their journey to Bethlehem. Perhaps Mary was riding that donkey because she was so pregnant, so great with child. They saw it all unfold just as Gabriel had said. She brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. They saw Mary in labor. They saw the pain and the sweat of the labor. They saw Joseph give the comfort that he could. They saw Mary wrap that child in strips of cloth to swaddle him, to make him warm, to make him secure, and probably to make him constrained as he slept. You know, sudden noises, sudden jerks, sudden movements can cause a baby to awaken. Perhaps the swaddling was to give him the security and the comfort that he needed. But the angel saw it all accomplished. Now here's what I want you to remember today as I close. The angel saw it all. They saw it anticipated. They saw it announced. And they saw it accomplished. Mary's lamb had come. The Jews expected a lion, but they got a lamb. A sacrificial lamb. In Revelation chapter 5, John saw a sealed scroll in the hand of God. And he heard a mighty angel shout, who is worthy to break the seal and open the scroll? No one in heaven, no one on the earth, no one under the earth was worthy. And so John began to cry. John says, I wept and I wept because no one was found worthy to take the scroll and look inside. And one of the elders said, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able. He is able to open the scrolls. And John looked, and he was expecting to see a lion. But you know what stood up? A lamb. And John says, the lamb looked as though he had been slain. Yes, Jesus bore the scars of sacrificing himself for the sins of the world. Jesus, the Lamb of God, took the scroll. Because, friend, he is worthy. And you know what the scripture says? And when he took the scroll, 
The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down at the feet of the Lamb and each one played a harp and each one had a bowl, a golden bowl of incense and they poured it out. And John says the bowl or the incense were the prayers of God's people. And then John says they sang a new song. And you know what it said? You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language, and every nation. The Lamb of God is worthy. Thank God for the blood of Jesus today. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Folks, the Jesus in the manger is the eternal Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Mary had a lamb. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the Christmas story. It just never gets old. Sometimes we can get preoccupied with other things because it's so familiar. But oh, there's so much to see and so much to learn and so much to apply into our lives. May we be reminded as we look at the manger that the Jesus lying there is the sacrificial lamb for the atonement of sin. One born to die that we might have life. Oh, thank you for the blood of Jesus today. Thank you for Mary's lamb. Without the shedding of blood, we would not have the forgiveness of sin. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jesus, for coming and being our sacrificial lamb. In Jesus' name.